Okay, let's go back to the words of Rav Kreskas and his understanding of the way in which Bechira works. And he says somewhat of like a very revolutionary idea, which, as we discussed it last time, really has some very practical applications for our lives. And he, he writes more or less the idea that the free will that we all have is quite limited. Meaning we've been learning this entire time that Bechira free will means that I will find myself in the situations where it's really hard to make the right decision and I'll have to push myself into the right direction or unfortunately I'll go to the wrong direction. And I'm using my Bechira, I'm using my free will to make the right choice or the wrong choice. And therefore the Torah itself is based heavily upon reward and punishment. If you do what's right, meaning you chose with your own volition of free will to do the right thing, you're going to get rewarded. And if I chose with my own volition to do the wrong thing, I'm going to get punished. That's the way that the Torah works. There's reward in this world, there's reward in the world to come. There's punishments that will come to a person as a result of their negative behavior. Rav Kreska says, it's not so true. Because really, you're just a creature that is coming into a world that's been rolling already in motion for 5,784 years of human existence that we know from the time that the gracious Baruch Hashem that Hashem created the world. And there are moving pieces in the world that are always moving and always, and always at work. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu got things. And of course, yes, I could tell you in the, in the beginning of time, there was probably more Bechira, when Adam Arishon, when the first man was standing in the, in the Garden of Eden, and the snake came to him and seduced him to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that was real Bechira, that was a moment of free will. Ever since that moment took place, mankind was on a downward spiral, where our free will became very complicated, and each person over the generations was making more and more and more choices, and things were moving along, and by the time we get to where we are today, how much free will do you really have? You're so influenced, you're so impacted by everything going on. There's so many things that are already set in, in, in stone, so to speak, the way that you live your life because of the people and the generation that preceded you. So how many choices are you actually making in your life? Says Rav Kreskes, not many. There's really not real so much free will in what you are doing with yourself. So then, so then what is Bechira? What is free will then? So he writes, free will only is, how are you going to respond to the action or the speech or the incident that you yourself were involved with? Meaning, are you going to be proud of yourself when you do the right thing? So are you going to find inside of yourself a, a desire to feel good about the proper things? Or are you going to be proud of yourself when you do the wrong things or you're not going to feel bad about yourself when you do the wrong thing? You have no guilt, you have no conscience, you don't feel any of that. Says Rav Kreskes, the only place that I could imagine that a person really has Bechir, a free will, is in his somewhat, we would almost call it like his emotional world of how does he feel about his moral responsibility to, to himself, to his family, to the universe, and to mankind around him. And therefore, he's limiting our free will to the after the fact. After you already did what you did, and you really had no choice to, in any way because it was just set in motion already. So now how do you respond to that? How do you feel about that? How do you view what you've done? Are you happy with what you've done? Or are you, not, are you disappointed in yourself for what you've done? Do you think that it's a good idea to do chesed and give tzedakah and the like? Or did it bother you that when you had to give that stock to that person, you had to part with your money? Like, how do you feel about it? So your spiritual feelings are what you're in control of, says Rav Kreskis. And how you're going to deal with them, that's going to be your world of free will. Hard to understand. Yeah. It, I'm, I'm, not saying that it, I'm not saying that it's easy. I don't think it's hard to understand. I, just, I, I, I find it harder to read it. Okay. With Adam, Adam was given a certain amount of knowledge. He was just, just wasn't just created and he had a blank mind and he said, oh, there's an apple, they have an apple. He was told he can't eat an apple. So he went against God and ate the apple. And he had 
had some knowledge because he wasn't born beheaded. He had to be a, filled with something. Okay. So he was told not to do something, and he made a choice, and he did it. And I can't see why, I, and I can't, I, can't for, I can't perceive how God didn't know what he was going to do. And therefore, you can go back to the saying, well, God already No, uh, again, God of course do. God knows what's so good, what's good, we're going to do. Free will. He of course. He trained him to do this. No, but, no, that's, that's going back. She didn't train us to do anything. The simple understanding of free will is, is that we are not controlled at all by the things that are going on around us. We have free will to do with our lives whatever we want. Now, Hashem knows, of course, because Hashem knows everything. Yes, but all the experiences we have is based on Hashem. So all those experiences we have, we make decisions with. Okay. So I've made a decision that was given to me with all the experiences I have through Hashem. Okay. So, and, meaning, and how I me- take those experiences and what I choose to decide with it, Hashem already knows, and He guided me to make those decisions. He well, could, he, right. he could have made. Well, in you know, in in a way, in a way, that is what He's saying. He's saying that if you think about your life, you're not born in a vacuum. You're a person that's coming after thousands of years of historical existence. You're a person that was born into a family and your parents were your parents and they raised you in the way that they did. You were born at a certain time in history and the culture of the world or the, the, the spirit of, of humanity was what it was at that time. You were born a Jew, so therefore that, that lends itself to a separate approach that you have to life. And your friends growing up were Jewish, and the families that you were around were Jewish, so on and so forth, so that they also had an impact and influence on you. So, who's in charge of all of that? That's Hashem. Yes. Right? No, but I think there's So, who's it? That's Hashem. Hashem is the one that has masterminded your entire <clears throat> life. So that means that all of the circumstances that I have in my life, which are making me the person that I am right now at this moment, HaKadosh Baruch is the one that set everything up and made me who I am. So therefore, when I make a decision, I'm not really making a decision. Yeah. Hashem already like pushed me into this, into this direction, and therefore I'm doing what HaKadosh Baruch Hu obviously pushed me into such a direction to do. So that's really what he's saying over here. He's saying, he's saying that you don't fool yourself into thinking that when you make a monumental decision in your life, you made that decision. You are already led in that direction clearly by everything that has gone into you to get to this moment in your life. And that's not Kodesh Baruch Hu. So you don't have free will. That's what he's saying. So then, but, but there is free will. So then where's the free will? If at the end of the day, everything has been maneuvered in my life to bring me to this point, and therefore it's almost like I don't really have a choice because I'm going to do anyway what I've been, that I would have been influenced to do all of my life. So then where's my bechir? Where's my free will? So that's his chiddish, that's his novel concept. You have to say this free will. Because the whole Torah is made about free will. So where's the free will? It's only in once the action is done, you have, a, you have a spiritual world about you that you will have to decide, are you pleased with the action that you were thrust into doing or you're not pleased with it? Are you okay with what you did or you're not okay? Are you disappointed that you would have to do such a thing or you're not disappointed? How are you going to gauge the, the, the actions that you have done? What is your spiritual, internal reaction going to be to that? And therefore, if let's say you're doing something that is good and your reaction is, I'm very happy with myself and I, it, it creates more, so then you'll be able at that point, it would seem to be, you'll be able at that point to bring yourself to more, um, more events in your life, more actions in your life that are going to allow you to continue to uh, feed into, so to speak, that internal desire that you have to do the right thing. And if you saw yourself do the wrong thing, so then hopefully it will help you in the future to avoid doing the wrong thing. Meaning even though that Hashem is kind of pushing in a certain direction, it doesn't mean that you can't stop the flow if it's something that you don't really want to do.
but you don't want to do the mitzvah, do you get rewarded for that? Or? So, so, so now, so that's what he's saying. That's a very good question, Mitch. According to Rav Kreskes, it would seem to be what he's saying is that you're not really going to get a reward for doing the mitzvah itself because you, you were just you were pushed in that direction. You're a good guy. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he made things work in a certain way. Like, like, again, like we said before, if I, let's say, you're a Baal Tshuva, okay, which means that for 35 years of your life, you never kept Shamas. And then you and your wife made a monumental decision, we're going to start keeping Shabbos. Or your wife decided you're going to keep Shabbos, and you said, I'm going along for the ride over here, because I love my wife, and I love my kids, and I want this to be a part of my life as well. So now the whole family is keeping Shabbos. So that was 30 years ago. So 30 years ago, when you changed your life, and you started keeping Shabbos, in Shemaim, in the heavens, the angels are dancing around and they're saying, look at the Gellers over there on Canasta Street. They are not answering their phones on Shabbos. He didn't get in his car and go to work on Shabbos. She didn't go to her neighbor's house and, and, and do something that, was, that would break the Shabbos. The angels are dancing around. The reward is enormous that you're getting in those beginning years of your life of keeping Shabbos when it was very hard. But now you're 30 years into it. And so it's like a no-brainer. I don't talk on the phone on Shabbos. I don't get in the car on Shabbos. I'm not even going to rip the toilet paper on Shabbos, even though I don't understand why I'm not ripping toilet paper, but I'm not going to do it. So does the rich Geller of 2023 get the same reward for keeping Shabbos as the rich Geller of 1995? That's the question. The answer is, I'm sorry to tell you, no. The rich Geller, no, don't, yeah. The rich Geller of 1995 was struggling every week not to get in the car, and not to talk on his phone, and not to see what happened in the in the ball game last night. The rich Geller of 2023 is I keep Shabbos, so now you get rewarded for the residual uh, uh, rewards and benefits of what you did. It's like I always look at it like it's Mary Kay Cosmetics, okay. You invest in Mary Kay Cosmetics and you put in all the money and when you are selling all those products originally, say so all the money is because of what the sales that you did. But then you convince your friend to sign up with you. And now the pyramid begins and they're under you or they're whatever, however it works in the yeah. pyramid, they're under you. And so then they start selling and now you get a kickback from what they sell. Then he goes and he gets his friend to join as well. Now you're, the, the pyramid keeps working up and you're getting kickbacks kickbacks, kickbacks, until you yourself don't have to lift a finger, you never sell another cosmetic product, and you've got a thousand people that are now under you as a result of the original act that you did by signing up, of, of signing up yourself, and without doing anything, you're just getting money coming in every single month, you're getting a check. So the same thing over here. I made a very strong decision 30 years ago, I'm going to keep Shamus. And that's amazing. And at that moment, it was a revolutionary thing that was going on, and the heavens were dancing with joy that your family decided to start keeping Shabbos. And every Shabbos that you had to hold yourself back from the phone and the TV and the car and going to the beach and going to the movies and, and tailoring toilet paper and so on, not cooking food, you were getting enormous amounts of reward because that was real, real heavy decisions you had to make. As time goes on, and it becomes much more natural for you, and much more habitual for you, so then it's like, I'm not really choosing anymore, I'm keeping Shabbos. So that means then that, to say that you're not going to get any reward, we're not going to say that. Because you made a big decision at one point in your life. So therefore, the residuals, you're going to keep getting. It's like Mary Kay Cosmetics for Shabbos and for, and for reward. You're just going to keep getting the residuals from the original decision that I made 30 years ago. It's, it's all working its way, so I'm going to keep getting. It might not be the same level of reward, but it's still going to be rewarded. Rav Kreskes is saying, even that you're not getting. What are you getting? You are getting rewarded, it seems to be the way that I understand what he's saying over here, is that if you could engage your spirit in the mitzvah that you just did 
And you feel very proud about that mitzvah that you just did. And it opens up inside of you a burning desire for more mitzvahs and you're so happy with what you're doing. For that feeling, for that emotion, for that, that pure desire that you have to do the right thing, for that you're going to get rewarded. And therefore, if a person would end up doing the mitzvah and then regretting the mitzvah that they did, so then how, you're not going to get rewarded for the mitzvah that we did. And we might end up getting punished then for the bad feeling that we have. Maybe. That seems to be what he's writing over here. Now we're going to have to go deeper into his words to try to understand better. But it's, a, it's what we would call a chiddush. It's a very novel concept. Some of it, again, as we're saying, aligns with what we've been learning from the very beginning of the book until now. And some of it is just going off into a whole new spectrum of what Bechira is and what Bechira is not. You take twin brothers. I don't know many, so I'm just going to say that. I, who knows twins? But I know more twin girls, but I have But just twins. They grew up in the same family, went to the same school, and they're two different people making two different decisions. Right. So something was implanted into each of them that's different from the other to make different decisions. So it's how you accept those teachings that make you make those decisions. Now, somebody has to put those thoughts into your head. Correct. And I think that's where God, I think, takes over and makes the decisions for you. Even though it appears that you're making all the decisions, you're, you're thinking for days, how should I do this? You finally make it, but all those days that you took to make the decision was planted in you previously to come up with this decision. So it's all foretold. Well, I can't blame, uh, hey, I'm, I'm going to blame uh, it on him because again, I'm making the decision. Again, he I, gave me the information. Again, I'm, how I decided it, he gave it to me also. Again, I'm agreeing with you. <clears throat> that seems to be more or less what he's really no he said. But, so, but that's the question. How can you say there's no free will when the Torah explicitly says that there is free will? So that's why he's, again, that's why he's being forced into redefining what free will is. You thought that free will was when you are stuck in a quandary and you, there's two sides to the story of the coin and you're trying to make a decision and you, you actively make a decision for the right or for the wrong. You thought that that's free will. It's not really free will. Because if you take all the causative effects of history and all the way that Hashem made you and all the surroundings and all the people that had an impact on your life and, and so on and so forth, so it's a given you're going to do that. That's not really free will. So, but, so they're not, Rabbi Kreskis, where is the free will? Because the Torah says there is free will. And it's the, that's, the, so that's the foundation of, of all of the Torah that you will be rewarded if you do what is good, you'll be punished if you do what's wrong. If there's no free will and I'm forced into the mitzvah, I don't deserve any reward. If there's no free will and I'm forced into doing the Avera, the sin, there's no, there's no punishment. I didn't do anything. So he comes along with this like hybrid version of what we would call, uh, what we would call Bechira, and that is, I can only localize your Bechira in your emotional, intellectual, spiritual response to the action that you just did that you had no choice what to do. Meaning the real essence of who you are as a person let's say, is not, is not going to be as much defined by your actions, but rather by what's going on on the inside, inside, of your, inside the recesses of your soul. So there's your Bechira. And on that we could reward you, and on that we could punish you. But what goes on inside is somebody created that feeling. You're, again, you are correct, you are correct. But it's going to be up to me whether or not I'm going to allow myself to deeply connect with who I really am. I mean, again, think about it. The, I think the scientists have some kind of a calculation that the average person is only using about 7% of their brain power. 7%. So that means 93% of most people, most people are not using 93% of their brains. So then, what do they really know? They're only 7% aware of themselves. 
7% aware of what they could do, 7% aware of what's really going on inside of them, 7% aware of their neshama, of their soul. So if I will go through life as one of those people who's only using 7%, so then I'm a very shallow person, I'm very disconnected from myself, I'm not even aware of the greatness or the potential or the opportunities that are, that are with inside of me. So Rev. Kresk is saying, so which kind of person are you going to be? Are you going to be the 7% user of his intelligence, of his brain, of his soul, and remain a shallow individual all of his life? And you'll go through a world, a lifetime of mitzvahs and a lifetime of averas, of successes and failures, of the right choice and the wrong choice. And it will just, just, you're just going to be shallow the way that you connect to it. Or you're going to be a person that's much deeper. You'll use 10%, 20%, 40%, 50% of your capacity and you'll be able to access the much deeper parts of your soul, of your, of your spirit, of who you are, and you'll be able to resonate with the truth of who you are, and you'll be able to express that in this world in the right way. Which kind of person are you going to be? Shallow or deep? That's what he's saying over here. That's our choice. And I agree with you on that, but using the brain power. Yes. If you're only born with 7% of no, 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 you're born with, you could be 100, you could be 100%, you could, be 100%. You, could, you could use 100%. Look, one of the greatest sages of all time was the Vilna Gain. The Vilna Gain, it was said that he, with all of his greatness, I don't know what, it, what the number is, 75% he used of his brain power. Okay? He, at, at most of the works that we have of the written word of the Vilna Gain, he could not write down himself because his brain was working too fast for his hand to keep up with his brain. So he would, he would be surrounded by his students and he would begin saying over his discourses in Talmud, in the Zohar, in whatever he was talking about. And you have people writing as fast as they can copy his notes so they could put together all the words of the Vilna Gain. 75%. But that means that that's the Vilna Gain. So what was Rabbi Akiva using? What was Moshe Rabbeinu using? Moshe Rabbeinu, we have to assume, was using about 100% of his brain power to be Moshe Rabbeinu. So we, who are only using 7%, that's because we sell ourselves short. We could stretch our brains much more if we would try. Yes, but what made him decide, either Moshe or any one of these great rabbis, to be rabbinical instead of saying, you know what, I got this brain power, I'm going to cure cancer, or I'm going to do some other thing that's more enjoyable to me. In other words, this was enjoyable to him, but what made him go to that, that direction? God put him in him to go to that direction. Okay, but again, whether or not you are going to act upon that in the right way and connect to it in the right way, again, we're going to have to see more in his words next time, okay, because he, he, he does explain more. Okay. But again, we'll see next time, but it, this, is, this is what he seems to be saying. I just can't see how you can live with God's power. You're not. You're not, that's, that's the whole point. If you would say that mankind has actual Bechira, free will for the decisions they're making, so he's saying, so then what, what's Hashem been doing in the world all this time? He's kind of just like, he's letting you do what you want? It's on your TV, you watch it. It's a big soap opera. Right. So, so he's saying, it's much more. Hashem yeah. is, is moving everything. The question is, where is your free will going to lie? We'll speak about it more, I think, in depth next week. Thank you.